So it is time to start, Excellencies, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, I welcome you here tonight to the House of uh, the European Union for the third edition of this series, uh, Let's Talk Europe. I thank you for this very big interest uh, that you have. Also those who are following us on YouTube and uh, RTL on live stream tonight, I also welcome you uh, tonight. And uh, Mariut Santoni, thank you very much for accepting our invitation uh, to speak to us uh, tonight in this series of conferences we are organizing um, because we are convinced that it is important now more than ever uh, to discuss uh, the future of Europe. Of course, in the run-up to the European Parliament elections, but I think some of, uh, some of you um, attend our conferences regularly, you know that we will not stop uh, discussing about the future of Europe with you uh, after uh, the European elections. But I think in the run-up to the European elections, it is important to inform about the EU. Um, we are living in a world of uh, disinformation um, and we have to put the facts right. And we want to exchange and debate uh, and engage with the citizens. That is the point uh, of why we are uh, organizing uh, these conferences. Um, and to get away from the slogans that we always hear, Brussels is deciding, Brussels is imposing, and I think some of you who are, who are here know that that's absolutely not the case. It corresponds to no reality whatsoever because of course all the real decisions are taken in Luxembourg. Not only because the EIB is based here, uh, no, but a joke aside, we want to give the chance to the EU actors to discuss with you and to inform you what they are doing, what is their added value, what is their role, and it gives you the chance also here in Luxembourg to discuss with these actors, to ask your questions, uh, and to get answers. So, again, very pleased to have tonight uh, Mrs. Santoni, Secretary General of the European Investment Bank. The European Investment Bank, which is exactly 60, or actually 61, uh, um, uh, that makes a very strong impact on our everyday lives, on people's lives, on citizens' lives. And I think uh, that's really uh, why we are also here. The EIB is an European institution on the one hand, it is a bank on the other. And I think uh, the history of the bank cannot be separated uh, from the history of the European integration uh, process itself. A few words about uh, Mrs. Uh, Santoni who has a very large experience both in public and uh, private uh, sector. She has been Secretary General of the European Investment uh, Bank for since exactly one year, and I think also tonight we should uh, celebrate uh, that. Before that, she was Deputy Secretary General for uh, three years at the EIB. She was Deputy Chief Executive of the European Investment Fund uh, before that and head of unit uh, for seven years at uh, DG ECFIN of the European uh, Commission. The most prominent example, uh, I think, of successful cooperation between the Commission and the European uh, Investment uh, Bank Group is, of course, the Juncker Plan. Uh, the Juncker Plan, I think there's nobody in the room that hasn't uh, heard of it. It's called the Investment Plan. It was launched a few years ago really to uh, reverse uh, the downward trend of investment uh, in Europe. Given the great success of the plan, it was decided to increase also the target volume of the investments from 315 to 500 billion euros and also to extend the plan uh, until 2020. Of course, Luxembourg has also benefited from it. For those of you who are interested, we have made a very nice uh, little brochure about this with concrete examples. Uh, last year, uh, I, I ask you to have a look at that if you are, you're interested because it has some very concrete examples of how uh, uh, the Juncker plan has benefited also Europe. Building on the success that uh, we know, the Commission has also proposed in the context of the future budget of the EU, um, an e invest EU a program that will aim to mobilize an additional uh, 650 uh, billion euros in investments. And of course, the EIB um, will be playing a central role in uh, implementing this program. So we have a lot to discuss tonight. The uh, objective is, of course, to have an active exchange with you. Um, I am also very happy that uh, my colleague, Horst Heinzius, he will be doing uh, the moderation tonight. And uh, without further ado, uh, I will ask uh, Mrs. Santoni to come here and to introduce 
the EU bank to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you so much for the very welcoming words. I am extremely pleased to be here today because this is something that the EIB is missing, this close closeness to the citizen and to talk to you directly. So I'm very happy I can do it today. And before I start talking, I would like to show you a short film, if you don't mind, please. <laughs> if it functions. Thank you very much. <coughs> so just to recapitulate, 49 projects since 1959, amounting to two and a half billion in Luxembourg. Um, the EIB exists since 1958, indeed. We, had, we celebrated our 60th birthday last year. And in 60 years, we have, in, uh, we have financed more than 12,200 uh, 284 operations in 162 countries, and we have dispersed around 1.2 billion uh, trillion cents. But what is important when EIB finances something? The fact that EIB never finds finances alone. We are always partnering with others. We are trying to crowd in private investment, which means that the investment volumes that we achieve are much higher. For example, here, within 60 years, we have estimated that we have achieved 3 trillion of investment in 162 countries. Now, when I talk about the EIB, in fact, I mean the EIB group. The EIB is not alone. We have a subsidiary called European Investment Fund that supports small and medium-sized enterprises. So it finances through different products, equity and guarantee products, small and medium-sized enterprises. And this subsidiary is also located in Luxembourg, together with the EIB. And the European Investment Bank, if you compare it with the other multilateral development institutions, everybody knows World Bank, isn't it? I think so. If you compare the European Investment Bank with the World Bank, in terms of annual volumes, what do you think? Who is bigger? Any guesses? All right, I can tell you. So the EIB alone finances an amount that is the cumulative amount of EBRD, of World Bank, of IADB, and several other small multilateral development institutions. So you can see you have something really significant located here in Luxembourg. When we then talk about the bank as such, the bank here in Luxembourg has over 3,000 employees. Altogether in the bank, we have around 3,500 employees. And if we take the EIF, we add the EIF on that, we are around 4,000 people. So uh, not quite 4,000 people uh, that are employed in Luxembourg, but then in approximately 50 other countries as well. So, but in Luxembourg, I would say over 3,500 people uh, employed by, their, by the EIB group. We have local offices, local offices in 50 different countries. We have a head, you know, a kind of branch, kind of a, a office, represent representation office in almost all European Union countries. 
but then also outside of the European Union. So we have a worldwide coverage. Now, we are a bank, and usually one expects from a bank that one has shareholders. Well, we have members. We have members. These are the 28 countries, which you can see here. We have the uh, four for Germany, France, Italy, and United Kingdom that have the highest shares in the bank, and then followed by, by, by other countries since the constituency of the bank in 1958. And by each accession, then the new European member states, Euro European Union member states, also became member, members of the European Investment Bank through capital increases that were made at that time. Now, you will certainly ask what happens with the UK departures. As you can see here, UK is still is our member. Well, basically what happens is that the, the, the participation, it vanishes in the air. In the statutes of the EIB, there are no rules to, uh, rule, you know, to say, to, to determine what happens if a member exits the European Union. So basically, we lose 16% of our capital. This is what is happening. But we are very confident our board of directors have done the necessary decisions that this capital can be replaced and that we can con continue on the stable path uh, even after the Brexit, what, if it ever happens. Now, we are a bank. Compared to the other European Union institutions, we are not budget funded, of course not. So where does our money come from? Well, our money comes from investors. And what we try to explain here is that, for example, Harry in California has invested into uh, pension funds. And these pension funds buy the bonds that the bank issues, that we, the EIB, issue. We issue every year between 50 and 60 billion of bonds. Uh, worldwide, but mainly in the, of course, in European Euro, uh, in Euro currencies, Euro currency, and a bit in dollar and a bit in British pounds. Now, when he invests into a pension fund, this pension fund then indeed buys the bonds of the EIB, for example, in dollar, as he is based in California. We have here also Helen from Sweden, and Helen has invested into an investment fund in Sweden, which in turn buys the bonds of the EIB. And like that, many people worldwide, many citizens worldwide, have in fact uh, invested into the projects in which EIB has also invested, or which EIB is financing. So we try to make the link here between the citizen and the final projects where the EIB has invested. So maybe some of you have also supported the financing of the National Library in Luxembourg who knows, through your investment funds or other savings. Now, how do we do this? How do we then finance projects? We are a bank, so of course we do it through lending. But we also have do some equity activity. What is equity? Equity means it's more riskier financing into normally a company, for example, where we take equity stakes. Or we invest, for example, in green climate funds or in infrastructure funds through equity stakes. But what is also very, very important, when you invest into projects, many of these projects need advice. When there's a municipality that wants to set up a refurbishment program, for example, for the schools, they very often need some technical advice through our engineers how to do it best. Uh, we try to help there. We help help with the structuring of the financing proposal. We help with technical advice. And we help through our financing terms, of course, because we can lend with very, very long-term maturities. So this is what we are doing. And of course, we can also provide guarantee products, uh, for example, through the EIF. EIF is a very strong in financing, uh, providing financing and guarantees to intermediaries that then lend to SMEs, for example. So it sounds a bit complicated, but basically, we try in the group, 
we try to cover, when you take a company from the starting of their business, from the creation, and then it's growing and maturing through the whole business cycle, we can cover the financing needs of this company through the different products that we have. I will go very quickly about this. It means what I tried to explain. When we, when we have a project from the project appraisal, we have a very, very thorough due diligence project, uh, a process. It means that our economists are involved, the engineers are involved. We have people that are specialized in social issues, for example, job employment, uh, job creation employment. Through the approval, through the signature, where, and then we start monitoring the project development. It's very important for us to measure the impact that we have achieved. And that's why the monitoring part is extremely important. And in the end, we of course expect that every loan is repaid, clearly. And usually the people do so. <laughs> now, when we then continue, what did we do in 2018? 2018, uh, the EIB financed approximately 90% of its overall financing in the European Union and 10% outside of the European Union. Overall in European Union, 56 billion and outside 8 billion. This is for the group. This is EIB and EIF together. By the way, I was asking you about the size of the EIB compared to the others. I can also tell that EIF, when we take the annual volumes of the EIF, it's as big as the European Development and, Re uh, Development and Re Reconstruction Bank in London. So EBRD in London is as big as your EIF here in Luxembourg. Now, maybe we then continue. Um, what are our priorities? So what do we really invest into? Where do we finance our project? Which are the areas? Well, we very closely follow the European Union objectives. And the European Union objectives and policies that are, so to say, where the European Commission has a very important law, the European Council and Parliament as well. And that is why our main targets are innovation, environment, infrastructure, SMEs. On the top of that, our statutory duty, our statutory task, is to support cohesion. And in addition to that, climate. Climate is something that has been very much in the, let's say, in the public discussion in the last days. For the EIB, since many, many years, climate policies and climate action have been one of our main priorities. Within the European Union, 25% of our financing is for climate action. And outside of the European Union, it's 35%. It's very important. And on the top of that, when we talk about cohesion, we talk about the regions that need further development, this is around 30% of our annual volumes. Now, it's difficult sometimes to understand when we talk about innovation, about what type of project are we talking about? And here I would like to show you one example from France. And this is an artificial heart. So this is a world's most advanced artificial heart, I have been told. And it's produced by a French company called Karmat. And the EIB financed a 30 billion loan, uh, gave a 30 billion loan to this company. And it allowed to continue, it allowed the company to continue its research and development activities in order to produce, to be able to produce this heart. Now, it employs 180 permanent staff, this company, but thanks to this financing, thanks to the growth possibilities that the company has, within a very short period, it expects to be able to double the jobs that it is creating. So it's, you see, it's important. Why did we do this? Because many, many commercial banks would not finance this type of risky project. You don't know whether a research and development project in the end will be able to commercialize its products. Now, 
if we think about Luxembourg, Luxembourg, what have we financed in Luxembourg? Well, we have, for example, financed SS Astra, so satellite financing. Um, if we think about the region, uh, in the region we have financed, uh, for example, Landesbank Saar. And what are they doing? They are financing again energy projects, renewable en energy projects in the region. So mainly now in Saarland they started, but they indeed, indeed intend to have a look also at Belgium and at Luxembourg to finance a re a renewable projects and geothermal energy projects, for example. And then um, if we think more about Luxembourg, we have also provided 300 million to finance the National Library, the building of new schools, and the refurbishment of old schools. So often these are projects that uh, you don't really, one is not aware of, but when we think about the motorways that you're driving through Europe, very often they are financed by the European Investment Bank, the tunnels, the railway connections. So basically, many, many projects, large infrastructure projects, are those where the EIB has been participating. If you think about renewable energy, windmills, for example, you think about Belgium, basically all windmills, uh, in particular offshore windmills, they have been financed by the EIB. Now, you know, uh, we were talking about facts and numbers. We bankers, we like numbers. But we also like impact. It's very important, whatever we finance, it really has a good impact to every citizen in, 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 in the world. And now, when we think about the impact, we can say that um, in the last year, the financing that we have done, we have been able to support the creation of approximately 5 million jobs. We have supported 374,000 SMEs. Can you imagine every year we, f we support something like 350,000, 400,000 SMEs? It's a lot. We have supported improved health services for 27.3 million people. Can you imagine this is exactly the number of the people in US that have no access to health insurance? And if you think about transport, then transport investments of last year, I expected to support something like 290 uh, additional trips. That's as far as if all the European nations who don't already live <laughs> on the Mediterranean took a trip to Nice. And the list goes on and on. So, this is very important. This is the important part of estimations, of course, but then in the end of the monitoring of a project that we can show what we have achieved. In the beginning, I tried to say that when we invest, when we finance, we always do it with the others. This means that if you, for example, look at the 2018, with 64 million, we have been able to finance 230 billion of investment because we attract other, invest uh, other financiers, other banks, equity financiers, and so on, guarantee institutions. Madame Bacchus, <coughs> in the beginning, also referred to the Juncker Plan. <coughs> Juncker Plan has been extremely important for the EIP group. It has really changed the DNA of the bank. It has allowed us to, to support much riskier projects than what we ha would have done before. So in particular in the research and development area, young companies, growing companies, and we are very happy that we have been able to do this to support the com competitiveness and growth in European Union. Now, this slide and this picture looks complicated, but it's basically what it tries to say that with rather small amount of European Union budget funding, combined with the EIB own financing, we can achieve a total investment of 500 billion euros in the end of 2020. Last year, the so-called first phase of the Juncker plan ended. And before the time really was there, we succeeded achieving the 350 billion that we promised. 
and we, in fact, we succeeded in achieving higher investment amounts. So this has been a real game changer for the bank, but it has been also a game changer for Europe. We are convinced about that. It has strongly increased the visibility among many, many companies uh, and showing the European Union support that is so important. When we think, when we got look closer at the Juncker plan in 2018, I say Juncker plan because, of course, the, the official name is called European Fund for Strategic Investment. But Juncker plan, we are in Luxembourg, it sounds like somehow better. Now, in 2018, we uh, approved, by 2018, we approved 1,000 operations, uh, slightly over 1,000. FC financing approved was 70 billion euros. And the overall investment that was ach achieved was 375. So we were supposed to achieve 315, we succeeded in 375. And this has been a great, great joint endeavor between the EIB, the EIF, and the European Commission. And for example, there, I think I, we can only say that as this is a real, you know, de real demonstration of partnership. So thank you for that. Now, here I have, I have told you a lot. I hope you will have uh, many, many questions to raise and that I can answer as well. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Santoni, for this inter interesting and rich presentation. Dear audience, let me kick off the Q&A session uh, with one first question. Mrs. Santoni, in one of the publications that I wrote uh, a couple of days ago, it is mentioned our bankers invented the green bond market. Can you tell us more about it, please, and explain where does Luxembourg come in with this? Thank you. My favorite topic, green bonds. Now, the EIB was the first bank ever to uh, issue green bonds. That was back in 2007. Uh, since then, the, the markets have grown. Other institutions have come along. And what the, what the Luxembourg, uh, the, uh, let's say the role of Luxembourg is here, it's a Luxembourg stock exchange in particular. We, the, the close uh, partnership with the Luxembourg stock exchange has not only uh, facilitated the issuance of those bonds, but the Luxembourg stock exchange has helped also to set up certain standards, increase the visibility by other institutions, and then also attract other issuers. And I think, for example, China is one of the bond issuers nowadays, green bond issuers in Luxembourg. And I think for the stock exchange as such, it has been very helpful, but again, it's an impact that counts. You know, our investors, they receive reports on all the financing, all the projects that we are doing, very detailed information on the impact on climate action and on environment. So they know exactly when they go and report on what they have invested, they can count on their uh, data that the EIB is providing. And if I may add, last year we did something new. We issued something called sustainability awareness bonds. And we did this because in the context of the, of the let's say, SDG goals, sustainable development goals, water, the treatment of let's say, of grey water, and uh, we have issued special bonds for this, where again, through the monitoring and through the reporting that we are providing, investors can have uh, the, let's say, assurances they need to also show that they are in line with the corporate social <coughs> responsibility standards, and when they report on their, let's say, uh, green uh, investments, this is the very nice thing they can do. Thank you. So the, the, f the audience is for you. Uh, the questions are open. Please raise your questions if you want. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation, which is uh, very informative. Uh, I have a question concerning the, the part of the EIB budget that is devoted to the Global South. As we know, the European Union has reaffirmed its commitment to supporting the Global South in its way towards implementing the SDGs. So what would you say in terms of those 10% budget, particularly how is the 
EIB participating in that effort and what are the main challenges you will mention? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think this is an very important. I think uh, on the sustainable development goals first, we have to enhance our efforts in all areas. It's not only, let's say, uh, one region. Uh, we in Europe also, we have to enhance our, our efforts uh, to, to support the sustainable development goals. I would start from there. When we then come to the European Commission and budget availability, as I tried to explain in the beginning, our financing is normally not linked to a budget. However, when we are talking about projects and the development of projects to a bankable level that we can finance, very often we join the forces with the European Commission and we work very, very closely, for example, with the delegations in order to develop projects mainly infrastructure, renewable energy, uh, in, in the environmental sectors, that can get also the financing of the bank. Because in the end, we are a bank, and we are not, so to say, providing subsidies, but we are very interested in, in the region to finance uh, projects that are bankable, and that where we can see the, the real impact on the environmental side, on the climate action side, for example, uh, or growth, job creation, all those matters. Hello, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Uh, we heard a lot about how the bank generates capital. I'm interested more in, as well, in how uh, the bank disperses its uh, financing in order to uh, spur development, particularly with regards to SMEs. How does the bank define an SME and how does it define its eligibility criteria? Thank you very much. Once again, we follow the European Union guidelines. So what we use for the SME criteria are the guidelines of the European Commission. Uh, how we do this? How can we disperse funding? We don't have direct access to the SMEs. I mean, we have only three, three and a half thousand people we, that we cannot do. However, uh, if we take, for example, EIF, European Investment Fund, our SME arm, financing arm, in the European Union. They finance SMEs through intermediaries, so banks, guarantee institutions, or through equity funds. So there is no direct link. However, let's say the disbursement scale is rather fast because this, normally these are innovative SMEs that are supported, for example, by the equity funds. So it's an equity management team, equity fund management team, then then selects the, the, you know, the, the SMEs that can benefit from the financing. When we talk about the bank, we do the same. We use fi uh, intermediaries, so other banks usually. We lend to the banks, and they then on lend to the SMEs. When we talk about advisory services, under advisory services, the European Commission, under an instrument called Advisory Hub, has uh, supported the EIB so far that we can advise SMEs, sizable SMEs normally, in the innovative, that are innovative, either in the research, have difficulties in accessing capital, where we can then support them to develop a financing structure that they can go and attra attract the financing w from one of the banks or from an investment fund, an equity fund, um, that type of support we can do. The means are not enormous, but still, uh, thanks to the European Commission support, we can do that to a certain extent. But indeed, we, as regards SMEs, we don't finance directly. Thank you for your explanations. Do you have any uh, ban on country or on regions because of lack of democracy, of uh, death penalty, etc.? Thank you for the question. Here again, we follow very closely the European Union policies. So if there is, for example, sanctions that are now, now uh, on Russia, then of course we cannot finance any project in Russia because we follow exactly the sanctions that are that are applicable. Um, and otherwise, indeed, we follow the external action service uh, and then the, the guidelines of the European Council and the Commission, of course. Uh, 
Good evening. I'm sorry for my voice. <laughs> I wanted to know what would happen to the BEA if there was a crisis like they had a few years ago from the United States. Do you have a way to protect yourself, to have reserves, or do you count on some members to help you? How does it work? Or do you have a, a big insurance company or insurance groups to, uh, to face the problem? Thank Excuse you for the question. This is very important. In fact, the EIB uh, is managed in a manner where every year we have, we can, um, let's say, uh, generate <coughs> reserves. So when we think at the members of the EIB, all the countries that have, let's say, a shareholding in the EIB, in fact, their cash contribution has been very small compared to the balance sheet what we have. This is why we have a considerable amount, considerable amount of reserves. But on the top of that, the amount of callable capital of the member states is also there. So in case EIB would, in a situation that it faces a crisis, the member states stand behind the bank. Now, I must say, I have to say this, of course, the EIB is managed very prudently, very, very prudently. So it should be able to face any type of crisis that is, that is uh, let's say, in, uh, globally, that could come. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I would ask, I would like to ask, uh, can you combine uh, EIB uh, EIB activities with structural funds, and if it is possible, <coughs> what uh, is about uh, what is the share of uh, such activities in your bank? Now I would have to ask my experts what is the share of such activities in the bank. But we do combine because, for example, if we take the EIF, EIF is supporting the creation of investment funds that are in fact financed by the structural funds. We have done it, for example, in the Baltic region. We have done it in the Eastern Europe. So we do combine, uh, so we, do, we do use structural funds for some of the instruments that we are having. For example, we are also managing, uh, now it gets a bit technical, we are managing uh, structural funds in certain regions. Then what can be done, in particular in the SME area, that there is a combination of different budgetary sources, including structural funds, which we then combine with, the, with our financing. Now, I cannot unfortunately tell you what is the portion. It is doable in certain type of projects, in particular in the area of SMEs. When we then talk about infrastructure, there it is normal that when there is, for example, a project, let's say a railway track, financed by the structural fund grants, that there is a portion that the EIB can finance. This is so-called co-financing. And we do, it is a good part of, uh, of the business indeed. So it is doable. Mr. Santoni. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this presentation. I would like to ask you a question maybe bigger than uh, this just uh, talking uh, uh, EIB. Uh, so I think that uh, mm, the fiscal compact uh, arising from an economic view, uh, <laughs> which is too strict, uh, which present days that we are, the present days that we are living. And I think that we are living in a world where uh, the, the world GDP depends upon a commercial agreements uh, between uh, America and uh, China. So Europe actually is out. So my question is, in your point of view, how can we find out a program who, uh, which combine the needs to bet on the investments which, uh, um, which give a new uh, impetus to European growth, uh, economics European growth, and also to reduce the public debt on the European country. Uh, that is not just a problem of Italy, 
but also other kind of uh, country. Thank you very much. You are raising a very complicated question, I would say, <laughs> now, about the usefulness of uh, cross-domestic product. I think this is a very interesting topic that is also debated by our economists. And uh, every now and then we come back to that, whether that is the right measure uh, that we are using. Now, on the reduction of public debt, I have unfortunately no magic uh, you know, tool in my arm in order to answer that question. That is rather for my colleagues, maybe from the European Commission and the European semester. You know, on the European semester, nowadays, the EIB is very much trying to help the Commission to uh, develop these, uh, these programs for countries, because we have so much knowledge about the investment in the country, investment needs, investment gaps. So here we are trying to join the forces and try to find ways to help the countries to, to find you know, solutions. However, unfortunately, I don't have the magic solution in my arm <laughs> for that question. Thank you. Maybe I can try a more simple one. How can uh, uh, Luxembourg SME benefit from the Juncker plan? Oh, this is a good question. Now, basically, there are a few equity funds, for example, in Luxembourg, that have uh, uh, benefited from Juncker plan already, and I think also a few banks. So either loan through a one of the banks or through a, um, a equity stake, or even better, this company is very innovative, does not have access to the banks, is looking for solutions to make a structure that he can accept, or it can accept the get the financing, and maybe there through the advisory services we can then help. So there's direct contact to the investment bank, or is there any other intermediary? Now, under advisory services, it is a direct contact. It goes through the commission, though, and through the financing, it's always through the intermediary. Thank you. Who had another question? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I was wondering how concessional are the loans uh, provided by the EIB, as opposed to regular, um, you know, like loans from uh, commercial banks? Uh, I have to clarify. When you talk about concessional, what do you mean by concessional? Because it has different meanings in our world. All right. Okay. Thank you. Now, uh, the EIB. Uh, how we are financing, how we are pricing our products. Of course, it's based on risks. And of course, on our funding. Now, we are a AAA institution. We are managed very prudently, so we keep our AAA uh, you know, uh, rating very important. And because of this, rate, this rating, what we have, credit rating, what we have, we, can, we have access to funding that is very cheap. It means, and as we then pass on the financing terms to the beneficiaries. Usually, we have quite good financing terms for the beneficiaries. But on the top of that, in particular, when we talk about infrastructure, we finance very, very long-term maturi maturities. Commercial banks would not finance 50 years, 40 years, 30, not even 20. We do that. But otherwise, uh, contracts are tight. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Madame Santoni, for your explanation and your presentation, very clear on AIB uh, operations. My question concerns the use of uh, smart technology and blockchain. We are in, in a particular hub for this uh, kind of technology, and we know that it will have a big impact on many sectors, including financial sector. Is there in some way uh, within the IB or with external uh, stakeholders an interest, a proactive role toward this uh, field, or uh, is it something out of the radar? Thank you. I thank you for your question because this is very close to our heart. Uh, last year we organized a hackathon uh, and we invited several teams to work in the bank for a few days to find out whether it is, use, it, is potential, it is possible to use the new technologies, for example, uh, for the trading in covered bonds. Now, this is something that is not necessarily so important for the EIB as such, but for so many other players, market players. So we are doing this, but it's not always for the EIB, it's indeed. Of course, we could do more. Uh, it's also a new area for us, but we are, we are looking into that.
Yeah, sorry that I have to ask another question. Well, um, going back to the 10% uh, portfolios of the European Investment Bank's um, investment project, 10% meaning the Global South. Well, there's a big controversy. In the Global South, the European Union, European Commission, including the European Investment Bank, is generally criticized of providing subsidies to European farmers, to European agriculture, and those subsidies contribute to a, an imbalance or let's say a disadvantages trade outcomes for the farmers and for the agricultural small and medium companies in the global south. And now that you support with investment project both farmers in the European Union and within those 10% portfolios, farmers and agricultural small and medium uh, enterprises in the global south, do you see at some point incoherences? Uh, if there are some incoherences, how do you deal with that in such a way that the European Union's action in general does not jeopardize what it's supposed to support in the global south in the trade in agriculture? This is a question, I like it also very much. Thank you for that. Because I cannot remember which country, Sabine, it was. Was it in Kenya where we invest, when we finance a telecom uh, company? That, in fact, what was the story? The story was that, you know, in the agricultural sec sector in Africa, the people don't have so easy access to loans, for example. They had to, sometimes the distances are such that it takes a few days to go to a city and, uh, you know, ask for a loan to finance the seeds for the next, uh, you know, production of, um, how do you call it? Growth, exactly, voila, production. The seed, th just to buy the seeds, I need a loan. I had to work two days in order to get it. So what, I'm very glad also, again, here we are working together with other multilateral development institutions at the commission. What we did that is that we financed a telecom operator that uh, together with another, another company um, um, created an app on the mobile phone. And through this app, these people have immediate access to loans. So when <laughs> earlier, not only that one had to take a few days in order to access the city, it took then 20 days to get the agreement on the loan, it is immediately so to say, on the app. And with this app, this agriculture, this farmer, goes to the shop where he buys his seeds and can have access immediately. Now, not only that, this app was, uh, let's say, financed, but also we financed towers, let's say kind of solar towers, that produced electricity. So the charging of the iPhones and phones, and not iPhones always, but let's say phones, mobile phones, was much easier. So the support that the farmer got was totally different from a subsidy. And I personally believe it was a better choice because together with this app, there were also programs that trained uh, the farmers to um, you know, handle the loan, to manage it, to be conscious about paying it back, it had social impact because often then the children had were able to go to the school because the f parents had the money to pay for the school and um, you know kind of side effects of the loans. So when we talk about subsidies, I would not always focus on subsidies when we talk about farmers and agriculture. I would focus on the innovation that we can do to facilitate the lives of these people and have easy access indeed to the credits that they need in order to make their production of whatever vegetables, whatever they have to do. And then through the selling of the vegetables, pay them back the loan again. So it's really a huge facilitation of the lives of those people. So thank you. Through the year, uh, yes, through the ACP, uh, agreements ACP. between, for example, let's say, 
African countries with the European Union. Uh, the, the fishery market has been open to European companies to enter. And now if we have a European entrepreneurs who would like to enter that market and do trade, he will need capital, so he will need some start investment which he can get from the European Investment Bank. And he's gonna enter that market with huge, uh, let's say, instruments and ships and so mm -hmm. on. And he will do that in a very sizable industrial way, which will have a direct outcome in the capacity of the local fishers, let's say in Senegal, to do the same. And they will be in a disadvantaged position to compete with them. Mm -hmm. So on one side, you fund the uh, uh, European entrepreneurs to get into that market. And then in Senegal, we have the fishers who does not have access to all these amenities and to all these new modern equipments in order to compete. And then you go on the other side and you fund more or less, but maybe in a different scale, that fishers. So uh, at the end of the day, it will looks like you are acting in a way that the fishers in Senegal will be more or less permanently disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as you know, there are some NGOs and some many uh, migrations, uh, uh, let's say workers, who argue that this state of affairs is exactly what is fueling migration towards Europe, especially from those yeah. fisheries communities. Yes. So what do you have to say about that? Thank you. I, now I had to give a more global answer, because usually the EIB, we finance local projects. So that is the difference. And it can, of course, be that there are then other commercial players, commercial financiers and so on, that would then finance this type of activity. But there also the social aspects of any project that we finance, they are so important we would not. And on the top of that, as we very often partner with the European Commission as well, these are the things that we avoid doing. Now. Do I have an answer to the question? Unfortunately not, because there are, I suppose, many, many commercial players that would be ready to finance these, these enterprises as well. So we can do only the part that we are doing, indeed, financing local, local uh, projects, local uh, population, local companies, local infrastructure projects. Um, but unfortunately, I think uh, talking about the other financiers, it's difficult. In fact, our president always says that we are the good news bank, you know? We bring good news because we do good things, good projects, with a strong social impact as well. Other questions? Thank you so much. I think this was very interesting. I'm happy that you asked all those questions, very different aspects. Of, uh, of financing of the European Union. I'm also very glad, thank you so much, that we had the possibility to discuss today. And uh, I think we have a bit of time now to have a bilateral discussion, so please, ever, whatever question you have, uh, I'm happy to try to answer. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> thank you again. You have still a question. Yeah, no, ah, st thank you again yeah, in the name of the European <laughs> Commission. <laughs> for your interest and uh, the lively debate. Uh, the Commission invites you for a drink and we can continue the discussion outside. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>